Uh, across the political spectrum, people have questions about the right to protest versus, you know, the right uh, obstructing businesses and airports, and you know whether this is, you know, protected under the First Amendment. People have questions about these things. The expression of religion, um, the credibility of the press is being questioned from both sides of the uh, political spectrum as well. So, uh, people's right to free speech is being opposed. Um, questioned as, you know, whether something is hate speech or whether someone has the right to speak out that way. So I think all of us um, have questions about these things and an understand, uh, understanding of the First Amendment and the protections it offers um, has never been more pertinent. So that's what we're going to be doing today, um, discussing these things, highlighting the different aspects of the, the First Amendment and giving you all a chance to ask questions uh, and clarify your own understanding. So I give you words. And we're going to have awards as well for uh, people who entered into the contest that uh, many of you did. So I'm just going to go over uh, quickly the kind of schedule of events today so you have an idea of what we have coming up. Um, we're going to start out today with um, a short talk from Eric Branscombe, uh, the Floyd County Commonwealth Attorney. Um, that, that's going to be followed by um, Professor Bill Kavar, who's going to speak about the freedom of the press. Um, and then we're going to have a panel. Um, on the First Amendment rights with Eric Branscombe, Brian Craig, the Floyd County Sheriff, um, Tree Gigante, who's an um, experienced activist, and our uh, attorney at law, Alan Graff. And they're going to have a, uh, I'll be up here to field questions from the audience about the First Amendment. Uh, following that, we are going to have an award ceremony for all the people who entered our contest. We had an adult and a child category for. Um, poems, essays, and songs, and we had many great entries for that, so um, the first place winners are going to be performing uh, their winning entries. So, um, uh, Then following that, we are going to have a, panel, a short panel on religious freedom with um, an acting imam, a representative of the Quakers, and a representative of the Jewish faith. So uh, I'm going to be your MC. My name is Nate Kretschmar. I will do my best today um, not to say anything offensive. <laughs> I, I guess if I'm going to, this would be the place to do it. Um, you can yell at me, you can tell me to shut up, but uh, the irony gods might strike you down if you do that. So, um, just, I'll do my best to keep things moving along today. Um, I just want to briefly thank um, all the people who sponsored this event and helped help put it on, provided money for the uh, for the awards and so forth. So. Uh, the first was the uh, Community Education Resource Cooperative. Um, we also had Windfall Studios that generously is donating some free studio time to the second place winners for the songwriting contest. Uh, Finn Graphics um, made up really beautiful certificates for all the people who entered the contest. Um, Jack uh, Wall and Kamala Bauer and of course the Eco Village um, donated this wonderful space for us to have this event today. And this event was also sponsored by the Office of the Commonwealth Attorney, um, the Floyd County Sheriff's Department, and the Partnership for Floyd. So give a hand for all those people. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, I'd like to hand the mic off to our Floyd County Commonwealth Attorney, Eric Branscombe, and he's going to make a short uh, speech and presentation. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming out. I want to uh, welcome you all to this celebration of the First Amendment. I think it's great that we have such a great turnout today. I appreciate everyone coming out uh, and being part of this. I want to thank uh, everyone for help that's contributed to put this together, Alan Graff um, and the Eco Village and all the different sponsors and the folks that have made this possible. The First Amendment, obviously, is one of our most uh, important uh, freedoms that are protected in that amendment. The freedom of speech is often known as the, as the linchpin of a free society. The First Amendment has uh, six separate rights protected in it. Uh, it was, along with the rest of the Bill of Rights, was uh, ratified in 1791 and became part of the Constitution at that point. It's important to note that the First Amendment and the freedoms therein are not positive rights, they're negative rights, which means all what they exist as, as limitations on the government rather than rights granted by the government. 
The difference is that in, when the, the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of, of, of speech, that that's a freedom that we all already have as human beings, not even as citizens of the United States. It is recognized at the time it was natural law was the theory that many of the founders followed at the time. And that, that freedom was considered part of the, net, the freedom that you had naturally. And the importance of the, the Bill of Rights and the freedoms therein is that it, it kept a, a reign on the government to tell us what the government couldn't do, not what the rights we already had. Now, personally, I believe of all those contained in the First Amendment, the greatest of those is the freedom of speech. George Orwell once said, if liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear. And that, that's what the freedom of speech is all about. And uh, uh, as uh, my friend Alan Graff, who helped put this together, frequently reminds me, is that free speech is often offensive speech. And that's certainly something that we've seen a lot of lately. <laughs> and the election of 2016 certainly had a lot of offensive speech, both sides, every, every which way it was coming at us. But the obvious concern when you have something like that is what happens in, in American society when we start to lose sight of the value of freedom of speech? Let me pose a hypothetical for you. Let's take, hypothetically, first of all, that you have a president. A president that's arrogant, a president that's pompous, he's thin-skinned and argumentative. Let's assume, secondly, that, that the, uh, the, this president, whose party uh, was elected at the same time he was, now controls both houses of Congress. Thirdly, that the issue before this president or that this, this president and his party decide to make their number one issue, their burning issue facing the country, is immigrants. What to do with immigrants and the danger of immigrants that pose to the country. They look upon it as a national emergency, and the president seeks ways to expel those immigrants that are deemed dangerous. Fourthly, let's consider in this hypothetical that there's an opposition party that forms a resistance to the president and questions the president at every turn in, in his trying to you know, rule and, and enact his legislation on immigrants. And then finally, let's consider that at some point, president and Congress get together and pass a law after having heard from the opposition and the resistance that they decide to criminalize any criticism of the government, in particular, any criticism of the president. Now, as you may have realized, we don't have to wonder about what happens with that. It's already happened. The year was 1798. The president was John Adams. He was a Federalist president. He was known for his love of pomp. Uh, when he would go and give official speeches, he often would wear a purple robe with gold epaulets on the side and parade back and forth in front of Congress when he gave his speeches. He was so argumentative, he was known as Old Querulous. <coughs> the, uh, the Federalist Party, he was a party of, the, the, of John Adams, controlled both houses of Congress. They were a party that was very big into uh, in having a national bank, businesses, mercantilism, trade, etc. But the, uh, the issue, the burning issue before the country was immigrants because it was in uh, 18, 1789, the French Revolution had started in France, of course, and had been causing waves of problems throughout Europe. And one of the issues was immigrants from France to the United States, wave of what we would call refugees. But at the time, people were immigrating to the United States. And this community, this French community, was... Uh, having more and more influence in American politics. The opposition party was the party of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, they were known somewhat confusingly to us today as the Democratic Republicans. Uh, 
they were um, primarily they were a party of farmers, uh, the uh, working class, immigrants, and uh, they generally stood for states' rights and a much smaller government. But more importantly, for what we were looking at, they were very pro-French. They wanted to help France. They wanted to have peace with France, have trade with France. There was a great deal of tension going on because at the time, 1794, just a few years before, Washington had, as president, had concluded a treaty with England, uh, easing over some of the ongoing issues that the early United States had with England and making it more peaceful between England and the United States. The French didn't like that. They were very anti-English, they were aggressive, and they took offense to that. And early, when, uh, in 1796, John Adams is elected president, and one of the first things he does with this rising tension is that he, see, he sends um, a diplomatic envoys to speak to the French to try to work out the differences. The French at that time um, took a very harsh approach to the United States and essentially demanded $10 million to even begin the negotiations. It was a great insult to the United States. The Federalist Party was incensed. And the Federalists already didn't like the French revolutionaries because one of the things that they were doing in the French Revolution was seizing property from the aristocracy and landed classes and redistributing it to, to the general public. That went against what the Federalists thought. That they detested the, the French Revolution. And so the tensions were increasing. And then all these French uh, immigrants coming in were causing a problem for, for the Federalists. So finally, the Federalists decided to take action on that. And in 1798, they passed the Alien Acts, which, among other things, made immigration far more difficult. The immigrants could still come to the United States. But in order to become a citizen, they had to live here for 14 years instead of the five that had previously been. And more importantly, if you were going to become a citizen, you had to make your announcement five years in advance. So if you didn't meet your five year in advance of making that announcement or to the proper authorities, you still couldn't become a citizen. So what it had the effect of was slowing down the number of French speakers, French, citizens, French immigrants that could become American citizens and hence vote. The Alien Acts also gave the president the power to expel non-citizens that were suspected of plotting against the government. Now, naturally, the, the Jeffersonians fought against that. They railed against it in Congress uh, at the time, something I'm sure is quite unusual to us today, that the newspapers were the main source of information for everyone, and they were highly partisan. It was, they were either Federalist or Jeffersonian. There wasn't very much middle ground. And when they, and the editorials of those papers drove the message of each of those individual papers so that uh, they were generally launching one attack after another on whichever political side they, uh, they were opposing. The Federalists came to believe that this was causing a problem that they were advocating sedition, that they were uh, going to interfere with the ability of government to act. So again in 1798, they passed the Sedition Act. The Sedition Act made it illegal to express any false, scandalous, and malicious writing against Congress or the President. What was interesting about the way it was written is that it specifically excluded the Vice President, who at the time was Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Jeffersonians opposed this, and, and uh, they, they opposed it vehemently on the, on the floor of Congress. In particular, one partic uh, representative from Vermont, Matthew Lyons, um, decided that, uh, and made an announcement that he was going to be the first person to challenge the law. Now, this was a, a criminal law. It was punishable by up to two years in prison and up to a $2,000 fine. And in order to question and or to, to challenge the validity of a federal criminal law, you have to violate the law. Uh, Matthew Lyons was determined to do just that. He wasn't any shrinking violet. He'd been in a number of problems before. He was at this time famous uh, for having been involved in the first brawl on the floor of the car.